The Fenris Rangers provide an inspection of medical supplies. Rafi smells like Starfleet. And Riker thinks there's something familiar about Beverly's son. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. Today, we are doing a review of Star Trek Picard, Season 3, Episode 2, Part 2, Disengage, written by Christopher Monfett and Sean Tretta, directed by our good buddy, Doug Arniakoski. How are you today, Sirach? Doing well. Doing well. <laughs> Man, this stuff pumps me up. There was so much good stuff. I don't know where to start. I know where I yeah. want to start, but it's more towards the end. So we should just start with what what do you think of this episode? Um I'm excited about this season. I think this episode is um you know, it's in line with the first episode. It's it's just keeping my interest constantly going up as one thing after another gets revealed. Um, and so there, this is my favorite uh, so far start and season of a season for Picard. I think yeah. it's getting to a place where I like I really want to see what's going to happen next. Yeah, I agree. How, now, full disclosure for everybody at home, we did uh, we had the fortune of watching this on a gigantic screen at Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood during the big Star Trek Picard premiere. So not only does this season so far feel like a movie, but we experienced it like a movie in the theater, yeah. gigantic yeah. with the musical cues and the crowd gasps. And just for a second, can we talk about the reactions from the crowd, from the audience? Because that's what that was moving me as much as watching the episode was, was experiencing it with all our fellow, you know, friends and Star Trek fans and the cast that were, you know, right next to us. Uh, we had uh, Michael Dorn and Jonathan Frakes, Jerry Ryan, uh, Patrick Stewart, Gates McFadden, uh, LeVar Burton. They were all right next to us. So we got to kind of watch their reactions and listen to the audience reactions. And it just felt so special to me because I was also thinking the people that put in so much time and effort into this stuff they deserve to hear their flowers just from the gasps and the cheers and the laughter at all the right places everybody was reacting the way they should and that just got to feel so good yeah it's special to um <clears throat> to have a screening in the presence of everybody who's contributed to um you know the universe of star trek um like you know seeing guys like michael akuda was like really a special thing for me to see him yes um but but guys like him guys like doug drexler um the guys who put in there. all the work yeah mm -hmm. you know um and the list goes on because I, I, it was just too many people to count from um you know behind the cameras so there's 111 uh, oh yeah it was more than that i think it was about 500 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um but yeah, just being around, there's a special energy. I thought, uh, you know, they kicked it off good with the uh, Metall Terry Metallos talking about, you know, what he what we had in store for us this season, kind of getting us yes uh, warmed up with with his uh, intro, um, and then uh, Sir Patrick Stewart taking the time to thank everybody that has you know contributed to making this all possible. And I thought that was a gracious speech that he gave. Um, he gave it up to his cast members. Um, and to Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> yeah, he to Gene Roddenberry. had a little fun. Yeah. <laughs> he did. But he also mentioned that it was an ensemble. And to me, that was that's one of the gracious things that um, the great captains do, is that they allow an ensemble to uh, flourish and it be about all of them. Uh, it's never just about the one star mm -hmm. of the show. And I think that's one of the things that makes the shows great is that everybody has a part to play and, um, you know, mm -hmm. contribute, contributes their part. Yeah. And so, so far, a lot of love in the room. A lot of so love far in, in these first two episodes, uh, it is kind of the Riker and Picard show. Um, 
but yeah, a little bit, but you know, like you're saying, Rafi has her moments. Seven of nine has her moments. Um, Captain Shaw is just chewing up the scenery to me. Like, I'm just like, where did he's an alien? Humans don't act that well. That's an alien. So <laughs> he he's unbelievably good. Uh, Stashwick, I believe is his name is. Um, but yeah, just to touch a, a little bit more on the premiere. Uh, Paramount Plus obviously put on a really good show. Also, shout out to our good friend, Levi Tinker, the uh, general manager at uh, yeah. Man's Chinese Theater, who is retiring after working there for 23 years. He's moving poor guy to Hawaii. Um, yeah, right he's got to rough it out. Yeah. <laughs> but so this was like his, <laughs> his last big event. And he's a huge Star Trek fan. And he also provided us with a place for Aaron's celebration of life, uh, which was a huge help and relief to Melissa because in those kind of times, you don't ne necessarily have the money. You certainly don't have the energy or the will or the time or the focus to handle these kinds of things. And he really stepped up. Great, great human being. And we wish him the best. And they put on a great show. Uh, Star Trek on Paramount Plus put on a great show. The actors put on a great show. And uh, so... I hope we're not a little bit biased saying it's just like a movie because we saw it on a giant screen, but we've also watched it on the small screen and it holds up both ways. Even when you're watching on the small screen, it feels like a movie. It feels like uh, a movie in every single way. Um, specifically, it just yeah. feels like it, it's big budget. It, it, it does. I mean, it does. The ships, the ship exterior shots are ridiculous, yeah. especially on the big screen. I was like, oh, wow, this is what, what it feels like. <laughs> um, because it actually gives you the grandness of the size of the ship, right? So when you see it on the big screen, it really feels like a huge ship that's capable of holding all of these people and, and traversing. So it, it has that larger than life feel to it when you see it like that. Um, so I'm I'm grateful to have watched this on that big screen because I did pick up on details, for example, that I didn't see on the small screen, um, specifically just small details that happen to fade into the darkness of the in the background. Yeah, you get the you get to pick up on those better when it's you know magnified by ten or by a hundred. So I felt I felt like oh okay these are the these are the things I was missing in the background when for example Rafi's in that. Um, what I called that Blade Runner type of, uh, you know, city. Yeah. Which we don't know if it's Orion or not, right? It's probably the Orion homeworld because I feel like I remember them saying somebody on Twitter, maybe Terry Metalis or somebody, somebody saying we are going to see the Orion homeworld because I remember getting really excited about that. And so this must be it. Or maybe we're just going to see it later on and this is just like a an outpost or a moon or something like that. But Orion so far is what you would expect, which is pirates and dealers and smugglers and syndicates. And clearly they may, we, we got to see our first Ferengi, I think in Picard uh, in all three seasons. And yeah. he felt very much like a mob boss, you know, a little less like, the goofy, silly, ah, oh, let me get you some Romulan ale, giggles, you know, and more like yeah. he right yeah. when you walk in, right when Rafi walks in, it feels like you're walking into the office of a mob boss. And this actor played it so well and actually was able to make a Ferengi intimidating, which I didn't expect. Yeah, I thought he was... You know, that's another uh, thing about this um, first two episodes that I like. The stars that they've brought in, the guest stars that, that they have brought in, have really uh, done exceptionally well. They're just nailing it as far as whatever responsibility they gave them um, individually. And, for example, this Ferengi, he was intimidating. He also seemed cunning. Um, a little bit more humanistic to me than past Ferengis there was a little bit yes. more like you know maybe being around humans has changed them a little bit so they you know the the Ferengi kind of slang and growl was less um prevalent or even worse um, but, hanging out with Orions 
or hanging out with the Ryans. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so I, I did notice that. Um, also noticed that they, you know, he was uh, he had some jewelry on. There were some rings on his fingers, just small little adjustments. I think I've seen that with the Ferengi wearing jewelry, but not that often with the men, for example. Mm. I think I remember seeing uh, Quirk with the or jewelry. Grand on, like, or Grand Negus. Or Grand Negus, yeah. Um, but just little things. I thought the, the makeup looked great. It did look slightly different to me. The, it did. The, the lobes weren't so big. Yeah, I mean, it was the, It was uh, a little bit head. smaller. He was a little more streamlined. He still had the, the four prominent bumps on the top of his head. But yeah, the ears were a little bit more streamlined, maybe like a little less goofy and a little bit more intimidating. Or he might be a quarter human, for example. You know, we, we don't know. Like, uh, right, right. There's That's always that possibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking maybe he has, um, you know, a multi-ethnic background. So mm-hmm. that was also a possibility. But um, he played it more along the lines of, uh, uh, he played it his own way, actually. It was his own way. But I would say if I had to pick somebody in the Ferengi world that was closer to how he played it, it would be Brunt. I had a feeling you were going to say Brunt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would be the closest to what I've seen so far of, of how he played it. Yeah, with how high he was getting Raffi, he should have been called Blunt. Am I right? <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, I love that scene. And of course, uh, spoilers ahead, everybody. And, and that was a cool scene, too. The way they had that, whatever it was, kind of eye drop. Mm. They did this eye drop drug or whatever it was that, you know, what did he call it? Splinter. I it Splinter, yes. yeah. Yeah, because it helps you to master four turtles. But he was saying, <laughs> uh, you know, because it says it feels like it's ripping you apart or something like that. But the yeah. major spoiler was how Rafi gets saved. And um, everybody at home, that's your hint right there that if you, if you really don't want any spoilers, <laughs> this is your moment to look away or listen away or both. Um, One of my favorite moments in this uh, in yeah. this in this episode, this part two for me was it this was, moment that you talked about. It was about. a perfect it was a perfect reveal. Somebody comes and starts slicing up the bad guys, cuts off his head, and I I think I I leaned over to you. I was like, "Is that Elnor?" <laughs> because because that's the last <laughs> yeah, person right. we saw. I don't know why I didn't think about it. We knew, you know, of course, it's revealed to be Worf. We knew Worf was going to be in this, but it yeah. was just so fluid. And so uh, martial artsy and, you know, that it samurai like it felt less like the blunt force that we're used to Worf doing. Um, and it felt more like precision slicing and dicing and speed and fluidity, which is freaking amazing. We all went nuts when we saw that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, as I was thinking about it, when you're just describing it, I, I'm wondering if that's the the weapon that uh that yeah. the curry was talking about it has to be right dan curry it's got to be the curleth yeah because it was it was kind of like a close range and slicing yeah. uh more so than like the big blunt force of the bat leth right yeah he was working that thing badass it just the moment when he walks in i'm like oh here it comes it's like that you know it's like the the climax of a bruce lee movie or a van damme <laughs> movie you yeah, know, some ass kicking is, is coming. <laughs> when when Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris are taking yeah. off their shirts and they're like, all right, here we go. I don't remember which movie that is, but there's a great moment there. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Worf's moment. So now I didn't, I don't think I heard it when we were in the theaters watching it at the premiere because everybody was cheering and going nuts and falling out of their seats, choking on their popcorn. And that was just me. Everybody else was reacting too. But when I watched it on the small screen and I had a little bit more of a chance to just kind of, you know, deep dive into it. Worf said, I told you not to engage. Worf was her handler that she was talking to. Oh, I didn't whole... even. Did right. You... Yeah. Oh, I, I did just, not catch just... that. I only was over that. my head. Yes. Because everybody was cheering. We didn't hear that little line. So I bet a lot of people missed that. But he said, I told you not to engage, which made me think it's got to be Worf. And they gave us the little the little flip around because they gave like a woman's voice. And I remember thinking that I remember thinking 
they're probably going to reveal it to be a male because it's a female voice and they want to kind of hide it. Even still, I did not expect it. Even even with all that and knowing Worf is in the You series. asked me if that was Elnor. You're like, is that yeah. Elnor? Yeah. You yeah. were dead serious. And I was like, dude, it's Worf. <laughs> it's got to be Worf. <laughs> I, I had... I. I, I was programmed to expect it, and I still didn't expect it. I still didn't get it until we saw his face. Uh, yeah, that was that was a special moment. Um, definitely liked his intro, and it's and you're right because because the crowd was so happy to see him for the first time. They stepped on his lines. It was like we stepped on his lines by clapping and, and hooting and hollering. He didn't even we didn't get to hear it, um, but you know the moment was special. Everybody was so excited to see him coming back. And of course he had the grays. So he's, you know, he looks like a Shaolin master now. And I, I enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> it was a special moment, but like you said, I thought, I think um, the whole number one in Picard, like this, this is, that's the main, like you said, focus of mm-hmm. what they're trying to show. This is like, or at least Picard for now. and Franks. At least for now. Because we know that uh, at least what they did in season two, which I believe is what they're doing again in season three, if I remember correctly, that the directors have two episodes each. So it's almost like it's five two hour movies. Um, so each two hour spot, each, you know, every couple episodes might shift focus a little bit. You know, like maybe. Episodes three and four will be more focused on the Wharf and Rafi show with a, th- a third plot revealed. You know, maybe uh, Deanna Troy, you know, does something and and then Riker and Picard are kind of off to the side or not shown. You know, I think maybe that each every couple episodes going to change tone a little bit. But yeah, it's probably the going to be the Picard and Riker show for 10 hours. And I am here for that. Especially, especially if they put them on bunk beds again. I, I want to ask you um, the whole Laris thing because I know we're not going to get too much time to talk about Laris, but yeah, is she? It feels to me like they she has something going with Picard the same way Beverly did years ago. Yeah. It seems like is that is that accurate? Well, she's new to Star Trek Picard. We never knew her. She before. did have a. Yeah, we right. we but didn't she did see have her like before. their significant other before earlier on. Right, in the first season. I can't remember his name. And right now all the fans are yelling the name out to the screen. They're like, it was obviously whatever. And he had the bump on his head. So she, when she flicked him, she revealed him to be a northerner, which explained why some Romulans have like a bump oh, yes. and some don't. And <laughs> in that one line, they cleaned it up for us nerds that are like, How come he has a bump and she does? <laughs> He's a northerner. Um but yeah, he died right at the end of season one. And then uh, Orla Brady. And is there's the this chemistry. Yeah, there's this chemistry between them that is romantic. Definitely. And it's soft and they're always intimate and these like, you know, fireplace moments where it's just like the two of them. And she's also knowledgeable of his love for Beverly. You know, oh, you guys had something special. Like, so they've had these kinds of intimate conversations about somebody he cares for. You know what I mean? So definitely. she seems really close to Picard. Yeah, they definitely have a relationship. I think in the second season they were kissing or, you know, they we don't know exactly how deep that goes. Or as the BGs say, how deep is your love? But we know that it's <laughs> there um, and they care for each other deeply. What I was actually thinking about this morning before we recorded was, are we not going to see Laris ever again until maybe season episode 10 when she finds out Picard dies or something like that? Um, because that's no. what it seems I, like. It seems like he said goodbye, see you later. And I don't know how, I mean, obviously they might bring her into the story in a way, and I hope they do. I'm going to go out on a limb early here. I have no knowledge of anything that's going to happen. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I don't trust Laris. Ooh. Yeah. There's something there. And it's going to come out later that 
I don't know. I just don't trust. I feel like there's some double agent action happening there Mm -hmm. where she's deeply undercover. She's double sided. She should be called Polaris. (laughs) Exactly. I don't think, see, I don't think so because we, we saw the second Laris, you know, uh, I forgot the character Lynn, I think her name was in season two. So I don't know if they would do that again, but you're right. There might be some other kind of twist, but I, whatever it is, it would be a shame to not use Orla Brady in the third season, other than to say goodbye, Jean-Luc, and then to show up at his funeral in, in episode 10. I'm just assuming he's going to die. I don't know, but it just kind of feels like this is going to be at the end of his story. Yeah. But it would be a shame to not have her involved in the story more because she's amazing. She's incredible. Well, 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 so when the when the trust no one line came from Beverly. Oh, you're right. Good point. I, I'm thinking that that's the person not to trust. Hmm. That's why I that's what I did. Who, who else? It can't be a, a star freak to get the crew on the Titan. Like, what do they care? Um it's her. She's inside. She's got the inside. She's in his house. She's she's fully. If she was an uh, an undercover agent, she's already in the mob. She's already been vouched for. She's Donnie Brasco at this point, and that's why I'm suspicious. That's true. Dropping the trust hint no of one. trust was, no yeah. one makes you think there's going to be a Judas character in yeah. this somewhere. Yeah. And and so while you're saying that, I'm racking my brain. I'm like, it can't be Riker. It can't be Worf. It can't be Rafi. We're seeing it from her point of view. It can't be her. The only person it could be is Captain Shaw. But I feel like that's too obvious. His arc is going to go in the other direction. He's going to become right. like, he's going to redeem himself right. by breaking the, the rules of Starfleet and becoming a cowboy like these guys to save the day and, you know, or something like that. Um yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're onto something. Uh, I'm just guessing. I'm just, I'm just reading. I'm reading what it, into whatever they've shown me, and that was. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just felt when he when she said trust no one. The other nitpick, I small nitpick I had, but if um, Beverly sends the message to Picard, coded in a code that refers to a time when he wasn't even in his conscious mind when he was in a Borg, right? Yeah. How would he understand what that code was? It did take Frakes. It took number his number one to decipher that, right? Right. So so why would she mention something that he had would, would have no knowledge of? That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, he, I get it. He would, ha- he would have to go to an outside source to figure out what the hell that meant. And it wouldn't be Laris. And if it were, we'd be even more suspicious of her. <laughs> we'd be like, how do you know what happened yeah, yeah. in season three of the next generation, Laris? Yeah. You are in Ireland. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so I, I was a little bit curious of why that would be the case. If if he has no knowledge of that particular thing, why would be why would that be encoded in the message? Do you know what I mean? It would be yeah. You know, the one question I had that felt a little bit like a nitpick, but then I kind of understood it was when they are going to give away Captain Picard's spoiler <laughs> son. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're going to give him away. But as soon as Picard says, that's my son, they say, OK, let's not do it. Let's sac- sacrifice 500 lives because. Captain Shaw says, I will not sacrifice 500 lives for some guy, right? He says, that's my son. Okay, then I will sacrifice 500 lives. Okay, so, you know, logically speaking, that that doesn't make any sense. But the answer, obviously, is human nature. That's just how, that's how humans are. Suddenly, because we all felt the same way. We're all like, now you really can't. That's Picard's son. It's just kind of like, that's just the way people work. Um, that's why people like uh, seven of nine roll their eyes at us, even though she's human. But, you know, if data were here, he would say curious captain, why is one shut up data? But (laughs) that I do want to focus a little bit more on what I just glossed over there, which was when Picard finds out it's his son, that's perfect writing. Not a word was said. She walks in, uh, Beverly Crusher. She looks at him. He looks at her. 
everybody in the theater gets misty eyed. Everybody in front of their computer or in their living room couch gets misty eyed just with that moment because it's all that nonverbal communications. They share this amazing, beautiful moment. And he's like, okay, I get it. No need to say anything. And that was, that was really cool to not have them say anything and for him to just get it. That's perfect writing. I did. I liked the Bowman as well. I thought it was special. Um, yeah, Picard for a second closes his eyes and then opens them back up again. And he, 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 he can't hear you. I was saying the music was swelling and it was just that whole, yeah. the whole setup, yeah. the shot, the, the, the composition as far as the music composition, all of it. Yeah. And, and Picard closes his eyes. He soaks in the moment. He swallows it. We can, we all felt, we, I don't know. Everybody felt it from the beginning when he says, "I'm Jack Crusher," and everybody's mm. kind of like, mm-hmm. "So we all were <laughs> yeah. doing a." We and Riker kept a, hinting a, at it. He's like, "Something <laughs> yeah. looks familiar." He's like, "Shut up, Will! Damn it! <laughs> don't tell me my business." <laughs> yeah, and and when that mean we were all doing the math. Like, how old is this guy? Mm-hmm. Looks like he's thirty. You know. And, just working backwards from there, like, well, where were you 30 years ago? Oh, well, we know where you were. Yeah. Um, and, and it was it felt great, actually. I did like um, the what, writing yeah. for that was great. And the actor who um, played Jack Crusher, um, Ed Spieler, Spiller. I thought he did a great job. Absolutely. Spiller. And we met we met him at the premiere and we we you know pounced on him and were and yeah. regurgitated a whole bunch of uh compliments his way uh and told him how amazing he was and the best part was that we didn't we weren't lying he was he's very good he's you're you're right in that all of the additional actors that they brought in uh the guy that plays jack crusher captain shaw you know spillier stashwick the lady that plays uh vadic i believe her name is captain vadic um Mm -hmm. God, so much great stuff with that. The shots of her with a cigar smoke kind of swirling in. That was mind-blowingly good cinematography. I It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. It gave us just a, a, enough peaks of her face to get more interested. But yeah, all of these extra people that they've brought into the cast, Orla Brady, who plays Laris, they're all just killing it. And uh, I mean, I want to harp on this uh, Jack Crusher guy, what, yeah. what it is that he does, the notes that he hits. So he uh, plays a note in his delivery where he is knowingly hiding information or being coy. And he's very good at having this kind of look on his face like he's guilty of something, but he's a nice guy about yes. it, right? Yeah. So, so it's like you, you kind of like, you know he's sneaky. You know he's conniving, but you also know that he's not that bad of a guy, right? Mm-hmm. So there's like he's not doing it for, let's say, ill intent. Um, he's doing it as a, almost a survival, you know, instinct for him. Um, so I do like him. He's, he's yeah, I thought he was great, and obviously they cast somebody with a another British a British. Uh, yeah. actor with a french <laughs> with a french lineage but he yeah. <laughs> does look very much like patrick stewart did in his you know mid or late 20s like they did also yeah. cast somebody with very similar uh facial features he did say one line when when he was being uh inspected by the fenris rangers he said oh it's medical supplies or something he says don't be daft and just the way he just, it was like a throwaway line. And I feel like a lot of people would want to hit it, like, don't be daft or something like that. But he just kind of like tossed it out much more naturally sounding. And that's where I was like, oh, very good. You know, like, I don't know. Sometimes it's just these little things that feels like a more seasoned and more experienced actor would do these. And a more novice actor or a newer or, or less comfortable actor would try to hit things a little bit harder. But Great line delivery all around. Also, the lady that plays Captain Vadic, 
I don't know what's going on with her, but she's freaking amazing. <laughs> uh, well, I, like... I do know what's going on her, uh, with her. Her name is Amanda Plummer, and she's Christopher Plummer's. That's why. I remember she's somebody's daughter, right? She's Christopher Plummer's daughter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he had an opportunity to play a Star Trek villain, and now she's yes. getting her go at it. That's right. Wow, that's cool. Um yeah, so that's what it was. I remember she was somebody's son. Uh, he played a Klingon, and she's playing. Uh, is she a human? I don't know what she is, but she's she's the captain of these other aliens. You notice her entire crew is this other new alien that we've never seen before. Uh, we don't know this race; they're brand new. I've but... seen them before, actually. They were in the movie Three Hundred. Uh, they were <laughs> part of the Persian army that was sent after Leonidas. By the way, I love that um, movie. I freaking yeah, loved it. I know it got it got me too. hit a little bit by the critics. Like maybe the story wasn't that great, but I was like, it's so artistic and so beautiful. It looked like a comic book. Yeah, and yeah. exactly. And it, and it's hitting on the legend of Greek mythology that we all grew up, you know, reading and, and fantasizing about. Anyway, not to talk too much about that, but good knowledge with the 300. Love that movie. But you remember those monkey face kind of? Yeah. Uh, you know, fighters that were sent. And that kind of reminded me of the the ones that we saw going after uh, Beverly at the beginning. Uh, mm-hmm. They kind of had that face. Um, of course, we don't know what kind of alien race they are, but that's what I they hope, reminded me of. I hope we get to know more about them because I'm a nerd for that kind of stuff. Oh, by the way, check this out. This was our old, it's a little wrinkled because it was sitting in my pocket that whole night, but <laughs> there it is. This was uh, is. everybody in there. Yep, everybody's in there. It's a great night. Um, oh, well, you know what? I, I was a little bit disappointed because Michelle Hurd's scene uh, lost audio during the playback. Right. When we we're in, in the theater um, for about 15, 20 30 seconds. seconds. Yeah. yeah Uncomfortably long. Like it, it, it felt longer yeah. than it probably was, you know, but right. we missed a part of her scene. Luckily, when the sound came back on was bef- right before she was going to have her big dramatic and emotional moment. I, I believe it was with her ex-husband. Um, yeah. So, you know, luckily we didn't miss the the big acting moment, but it was kind of a shame. Uh, and of course people started. Especially for the actor who plays her husband. Or that's his ex, only whatever. scene. You're right. Like that's his scene. He's in the crowd. He's like, he's at the premiere. He's, he's like, got his family, his family and friends. He's like, this is my moment. <laughs> yes. And, you don't hear him say anything from, like, until like you know, he got a couple lines out, but um, it was it was I just felt upset. I felt sad because you know that's their big moment. Me it, too. it kind of took away the gusto from I, I which I know Michelle because you can even though you couldn't hear the words, you can see Michelle Hurd's facial expressions, and she's so she's the best. Like especially when it comes to like that whole troubled and battling the dile- mm-hmm. like the dilemma of mm-hmm. trying to make decisions and conflicted keeping She's, it all together yeah. yeah she plays the conflicted person so mm. well you know who else does homer frizzell so uh we're going <laughs> to uh take a quick break and we'll have to uh hop over onto the other side stick around on the free-for-all before the free-for-all before we do that uh, let's give a special thanks to people that really know how to act. Not quite as well as Michelle Heard, but they're getting there. Homer Frizzell, <laughs> Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman Tom, Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, T.J. Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin, Arukin. who was also at the premiere, uh, Titus Moeller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Deepman, Anna Post, Rex A. Wood, Neil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Akasaka. Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, Matt Boardman, also at the premiere, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Jed Thompson, Amy Renee Haynes, Sean Mouch, Marsha Classic Schreier, Randy Frank, also at the premiere. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Susan V. Gruner, and of course, Jason Oaken. All right, everybody stick around. We will be right back. I feel like there's way more to talk about here uh, on 
the seventh rule 